somebody here wants this lady to suffer for the rest of eternity. We may have a crime here, but we've got no body. Certainly a puzzle, uh, and possibly suggests something a little sinister. There's so many suspicious elements to this story, it's really giving me cause for concern. It would just be a world of pain. of dead bodies became more than a science in ancient Egypt. It developed into a sacred ritual. No other people in history devoted so much time and expense to ensuring a safe passage into the eternal afterlife with their body intact. The skill of Egypt's master embalmers was phenomenal. Thousands of years ago, they worked to halt the ravages of time on lifeless corpses. Today, forensic technology can unlock that person's secrets to reveal the intimate story of their life and death. Over 2,000 miles from Egypt, in a museum in the north of England, lies the beautifully preserved coffin of an Egyptian mummy. But the body inside remains a mystery. The workmanship and sophistication of this coffin suggests that it would have taken weeks, if not months, to create. To be worthy of this top-of-the-range casket, its owner must surely have been a VIP. Dr. Joanne Fletcher is a renowned Egyptologist who's done excavation work and mummy investigations around the world. She's been called in to try and unlock the secrets of this hidden mummy. We came into this country a couple of hundred years ago, and rather than going to the British Museum or another major institution, it came up here to Newcastle. Well, it's obviously an Egyptian mm -hmm. mummy covering. It's obviously female from the, from the exterior, at least. So I'd be quite interested to sort of try and find out more about this individual inside. So I'm really looking forward to sort of seeing the mummy. Um, I'm afraid we can't do that. We, we really can't open this up because um, we're worried about damaging this beautiful object. So is she completely sealed? Yes, she is. There's yeah. no small openings that we could take mm. any samples or anything, no? no? It's completely, completely sealed. sealed. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah, it's good. this is going to be quite a challenge, I think. First and foremost, what I'd really like to do is take a series of photographs uh, from every angle, pretty much, so I can then go back to talk with the, the team in York and try and plan some sort of strategy, see what techniques we can bring to bear to study this, uh, this very enigmatic and fascinating mummy. This sealed coffin may be an exquisite work of art, but it's also an ancient mystery, thousands of years in the making. Joanne's already nicknamed the hidden mummy, the Lady. And piece by piece, she and the team will have to fill in all the details of who she was, where she's from, and how she met her end. This case will be a massive challenge for the mummy investigation team, given the coffin is sealed and they will never be able to see or touch the mummy within. The team are among the best in their field, but even for them, the task would probably be impossible, except for one thing. Two years ago, for conservation purposes, the museum had the mummy CT scanned. Computed axial tomography is an advanced form of the conventional X-ray. In 2009, 
Instead of revealing the outline of bones and organs, the CT scan forms a full three-dimensional computer model of the human body. This medical blueprint of the lady will allow the team to analyze specific areas of the body in great detail. The forensic data will be a priceless tool for the team as they try to uncover how this woman lived and how she died. Dr. Stephen Buckley has an international reputation for his chemical analysis of mummified bodies. His unique experience may unlock a vital clue on this mysterious coffin. Well, from the chemistry, uh, it's certainly possible that some sort of concealment uh, was going on. Egyptologist Jill Scott's specialist knowledge in ancient human remains will be crucial in unravelling the real story of how this mummy died. Injuries like that, I would expect to be lower down. down. It is That's very correct. high up. And Duncan Lees, who offers forensic support to criminal investigations all over the UK, is going to bring modern detective techniques to the case of this Egyptian mummy. Just because they're 3,000 years old doesn't mean that we can't apply modern forensics and come up with good answers. The lady, like every case, begins with a team briefing here in the incident room at the University of York. Joanne begins with the bad news. We aren't allowed to take this covering off. We aren't allowed to do any physical sampling with this. There is no way into this mummy. The team gets straight into analyzing the CT scan data. What interests me here is this, um, this sort of package, which I'm guessing is part of the um, embalming process, the mummification. Uh, internal organs wrapped in there. But there is a lot that we can do. I mean, using technology that, that, that uh, Stephen will be applying as well, um, that looks through the coffin, looks into the interior, and builds up still three-dimensional information that will be a good starting point for us to create a virtual reality person. The whole premise with this one is it's a completely, you know, hands-off zone. We're not allowed to touch. But using this technology to penetrate through the wrappings, through the coffin, we can hopefully then, you know, really bring this woman back to life. The team have state-of-the-art forensic technology like a CT scan at their disposal. But if they're going to unlock the secrets of this sealed coffin, they'll have to do so with absolutely no access to the body within. To get things started, they're going back to basics. Jill Scott is hard at work. She's already unearthed the museum's acquisition records and has discovered that back in the 1820s, when the coffin of this mummy first came into the country, it was opened at the base by the feet. The damage that was done during this operation is one reason why the museum insists the coffin must now remain sealed. Further analysis of the records reveals details that will help them build a profile of the mummy. What we appear to have is a mummy dating from the 21st, 22nd dynasty. So we're looking around 1070 to 900 BC as, as a sort of rough date there. The records state that the name of this mummy is Bakht Hornat, which means servant of Horus the Strong which makes sense as a name for an Egyptian female. And what we also have is a location. We have it mentioned here that she was found in a tomb at Gurna in Thebes, which is a really interesting place. Set along both sides of the River Nile, near the modern city of Luxor, lies the ancient city of Thebes. It was for a while prominent as a royal residence, the capital city and the religious heart of Egypt. It contained the necropolis in the Valley of the Kings and numerous funerary temples such as the Ramesseum, built by Ramesses II. But for all its architectural splendor, Thebes was at the center of a bitter rivalry that had split ancient Egypt in two. 
the south around Thebes is entirely controlled by the priests. So you've got these elite priest kings, these powerful, powerful dynasts that, that control the whole area. So whoever Our Lady was, she was very much under the thumb of these priests, both on a, a religious and, I'd say, a political level. I think the thing that interests me most of all is this Mona Lisa type smile to her, really enigmatic, and it kind of makes you wonder what's actually going on underneath this coffin lay. You know, what is she hiding? In order to find out more about the lady, the team need to establish what she looked like in life. But with her body sealed in a coffin, this won't be easy. They've brought in an expert in cranial facial identification. Steph Davy Jow uses her expertise on criminal investigations and archaeological cases. Taking the data from the CT scan, her computerized reconstruction model will reveal this woman's face for the first time in thousands of years. This is a virtual 3D model of her skull. Rather than showing you how she would have looked now, I can show you what she would have looked like at the end of her life. Steph has identified a number of changes to the woman's facial structure caused by the process of mummification. Her jaw had been rotated into an open position. Okay. And her nasal bones had been broken, likely when they removed her brain. Okay. So I rotated the mandible back into its natural position. And I've taken the nasal bones, a bit like pieces of a puzzle, I was able to rotate them back into where they would have been. Using standard tissue depth markers, Steph is able to accurately recreate the thickness of the skin all over the mummy's face. The next stage of the process is to add eyes. These are obviously quite important to the final appearance of the face. All the pieces are beginning to click into place as the face of the mummy is slowly building. So I've begun to add skin. Essentially, I've built a grid using the tissue depths and the muscles to build the outer features of the face. Is this a, a generic sort of mesh that, of, that you've attached to the head or, or does this built up as a sort of bespoke data set for this individual? I make it bespoke each time, especially in, in regions such as the eyes and the lips. It's very personal to the skull beneath. With the face almost complete, Steph starts to add the finishing touches. Here's an image rendered of what she looks like without hair. Okay. Quite statuesque, I think. Incredible. Very, well, beautiful and very striking mm. as well. Very strong um, features. To build an accurate picture of her hairstyle, Steph has modelled it on the painting of the lady's hair on the outside of the coffin. And there she is. That is extraordinary. This is how she would have appeared on the day that she died. The face of a 3,000-year-old mummy. The ability to accurately rebuild the face of this Egyptian woman, as it was the day she died almost 3,000 years ago, is an astonishing achievement for the mummy investigation team. Especially as they've managed to do it without even opening the coffin. Now that you've finished the reconstruction and, and spent so long working on it, what clues are, are hidden away in her face that you've managed to draw out? Well, you can see she was a quite striking looking woman. And you can see here she's got quite um, an extensive overbite. And based on her overbite, we can say with some confidence that she was likely of high status. This has been shown um, in various research outputs. An overbite is the vertical overlapping of the upper teeth over the lower teeth. It's a classic facial feature of Egyptian royalty. A physical characteristic dating back to the lineage of pharaohs like Tutankhamun in the 18th dynasty. This important discovery backs up the theory that the mummy was a high-status Egyptian female.
The mummy investigation team are among the first people to lay eyes on the lady's facial features in almost three millennia. Using museum records, the team has also confirmed her position at the top of Egyptian society, probably originating from the city of Thebes during the 21st to 22nd dynasty. But they are still no closer to working out exactly who she was or how she died. Joanne is hoping that the hieroglyphs on the coffin could provide a vital lead. This ancient writing system contains a combination of symbols and alphabetic elements. Hieroglyphs were an essential component of mummification, as all Egyptian coffins had to correctly display the name of the person inside to ensure a safe passage into the afterlife. They were first deciphered in 1822 by French scholar Jean-Francois Champollion, who realized that the Rosetta Stone was inscribed with the same text in both Greek and hieroglyphs, an event that gave birth to the science of Egyptology. Alan Fields specializes in deciphering this ancient Egyptian writing, and his knowledge could unlock the secrets of this sealed coffin. In his analysis of the hieroglyphs, Alan has noticed a series of anomalies. Ever since she was brought to Britain, she's been known as Bacht Hornacht, which means servant of Horus the Strong. But that's not what is actually written on the coffin. So we've got Ba Ke. Yeah. Then we've got a very hurried uh, water sign. It is hurried, isn't very it? Very hurried. They've not done a zigzag like no, normal. Which they've... I'm sure would have been as easy enough to write a water sign as it is to do that line. So we have Bakhet and Hor. Which translates as simply servant of Horus. Then I see Nakt, Bakhet and Hor, Nakt. The word Nakt, meaning strong, is separated from Bakhet and Hor by the equivalent of a full stop. This means the name actually reads as Bakhet and Hor full stop. Adding a nacht seems to be a mistake by whoever transcribed it for the museum. For over 200 years, this mummy has been given the wrong name, Servant of Horus the Strong, instead of her true name, Servant of Horus. Remembering the names of the dead was sacred to ancient Egyptians. They probably valued the afterlife more than any other culture in history. They believed that death was simply a temporary interruption and that eternal life could be ensured by preservation of the physical form through mummification. The pharaohs in particular were so obsessed with the afterlife that they ordered the construction of vast and complex tombs to protect their bodies for this journey into the next world. The 19th century mistranslation of the name is one thing, but the original scribe also seems to have made a mistake. Everything else it's That's actually just it. spot on, Everything it's well else done. Does work. And then we come to the major part of the inscription and suddenly we send the wrong person. So we can't say with any certainty the name of this lady. Exactly. Which means she, she can't live again. She can't. The description of the lady's status, a vital insignia for the afterlife, contains what must be a deliberate error. This she woman is called lord of the house absolutely and she's a lady of the house yep. she's not a man she's a woman yeah. so at the top they've got the sex wrong which is pretty fundamental it's maximum to hurt isn't it it's the maximum kind of thing you can do to this lady to affect yeah, it was totally misrepresenting yes. what she was in life a good instinct would be that i that, that somebody didn't want this person to live in the next world that an error so obvious as that um Somebody wanted to do mischief. A thing so crucial as a name, a thing that was going to take you and get you, allow you into the next world, a thing that you couldn't live without. No, it's a major, major error. Or has it been done for a reason? The deliberate misrepresentation of the mummy's title has thrown the case wide open 
leading Joanne and Alan to consider who would have wanted to sabotage the lady's passage into the afterlife. Well, there are a number of suspects, aren't they? So if we list the subjects, we can actually have a look at them. There's the family. Yeah. There's the scribes. And there's the priesthood. Could have been any of the three. Let's face it, what, what percent of um, Egyptians could read and write in this period? Exactly, Maybe I mean, two or five, one percent. One percent max. So a scribe could get away with that. Yes. Without 98% of people even well, looking at it. Well, who would know? Who would know what the scribe had written? That begs the question, what's going on inside this card tonight? Absolutely. Symbolic damage was done to the inscription on the lady's coffin. The team now needs to establish whether any physical harm was done to her body. Since they will never see inside the coffin, Duncan has decided to use the images from the CT scan to create a precise model of the mummy's head. Facial reconstruction established what this woman looked like while alive. Now he wants to know what she looks like today, sealed inside her coffin. 3D design specialist David Moore will take data from the CT scan to form a replica model of the mummy's head. Commonly known as rapid prototyping, this state-of-the-art technique will allow the team to turn the digital data into a 3D physical reality. We have a fundamental problem with this, with this, object, with this body, David, in that we can't actually see her. Um, we've got this CAT scan data, but we really need a visualisation. We need, really need to sort of look her in the eye if we're going to solve the case. Well, see, the problem we've got here is 3,000-year-old mummy is a lot of those tissues have sort of ab absorbed into each other and become attached to the skull and things like that. So what we're, what we're really going to have to do is push the boundaries of the software slightly and try and really pick out just the material that we want. Three-dimensional printers build up the specific design by printing thousands of successive layers. The model is then created by alternating layers of glue and chalk powder. The 3D result is a dimensionally accurate head based on the source data from the CT scan. If you're observing a real mummy, you have to be so delicate, you mm -hmm. know, contamination, all, all, everything that goes with that. What you've got here is an exact representation of what's lying within the casket, yet you don't have to be delicate with it. You can slice it in half, see what's inside. In a way, you haven't actually got a body here. You're looking at data. Continuing to build the profile of the lady, Joanne Fletcher is trying to gain clues from one of the oldest forms of forensic ID that exists. Teeth. Dr. Ian McLeod is a leading dental radiologist who specializes in the analysis of Egyptian mummies. One of the things we can see straight away, she's got a full set of teeth, including, importantly, her wisdom teeth, the third molars. And in most people, the third molar erupts in your mouth at around the age of about 18. And it takes another sort of three years for the roots to completely form. So if we look carefully, we can see these roots are fully formed. Yeah. So automatically, we can say this lady's over the age of 21. But if we look at this lady's teeth, we can see that uh, this is the first molar. This erupts around the age of six. The second molar erupts around the age of 12. And as we've said, the third molar about 18. Once the teeth are in the mouth, they start to wear, and in ancient Egypt, in fact, they, they probably wore their teeth quite rapidly. And if we look at the top of the teeth there, we can see that's worn quite a lot. This is a little less worn, and this one's worn, but not to a huge degree. So putting these sort of facts together, in fact, it gives us an age of around 30 at death. Life was hard for most people living in ancient Egypt, and the average life expectancy was low. A woman in her mid-40s would be considered elderly. So the fact that the lady was around 30 years old when she died makes it unlikely that she died of old age. 
Meanwhile, the 3D visualization of the mummy is almost ready. Without even laying a finger on the coffin, Duncan is about to see exactly what the lady's head looks like. Model's fantastic, isn't it? Mm. This is one-to-one -one scale data, so you're not it reduced no. or changed in any way the dimensions. No. So she has a very delicate, small head, She's doesn't she? Petite, yeah. It's incredible to be looking into her face. And yeah. I wonder who the last person she was looking at was. Thousands of years after her death, the mummy investigation team are trying to piece together how and why this Egyptian woman died. So far, they know her name, her date of origin, and where she lived. And even though she remains sealed in a coffin, the team now has an extraordinary image of what the lady once looked like. They're now reconvening to try to work out their next step. What we have isn't just a, a confusion with the name. There's certainly confusion with this woman's job title, the job description. We've got clear evidence of misspelling because these signs should read Nebet Pair, which means Lady of the House. Right. And quite categorically, that's not what it says. When you look carefully, they've purposefully missed out the feminine T sign. So, so they're basically calling her a him. Exactly. Exactly, right. and this is categorically wrong. And, and that's completely contradicting the ancient Egyptian belief systems. So I've had, we've had a good step forward as well with the, uh, with the data from the, the cloud mapping, from the point cloud data that we've derived from the CT scan. And this is going to be the only chance I think we get to look at um, her in real life. And here she is. Stephen is a world authority on mummification techniques. He immediately notices a glaring discrepancy. What um, concerns me and I notice is the, um, the difference between the uh, fine decorated cartonnage uh, uh, and the state of the, uh, of the face. You see the, um, the sort of undulation here. Um, it's almost like it's blistered or something, isn't it? Egyptian embalmers were highly sophisticated chemists who developed their art over thousands of years. A good embalmer would have preserved facial features to an incredibly high standard. But the 3D model has revealed the opposite. It's certainly not what you'd expect of um, a decent embalmer mm. um, at this time. There is definitely an inconsistency here, right. and I think, I think that's something that needs looking at. Where I would go now with this is, is to look at the body and to see whether you see it there. Sure. The evidence for foul play is building up. The team now need to find a cause of death for the lady. Using a printout of the CT scan, Duncan is consulting Surgeon Commander Mike Edwards, who serves with the British forces. He's seen practically every kind of injury to the human body. Armed with the CT scan data, he may be able to tell what has happened to the lady's body. After careful analysis, Mike is able to answer the question that has remained unknown for 3,000 years. How this woman died. If we look on the CT scan here, we can see that there is a massive incision or 
stab wound, it's whatever major, you want to call it. it. It is major and it's not regular at all. It's ragged and irregular mm. and extends very deeply. We're not talking about the, the mummification wound, the embalmer's incision there. No, we're not, because this is more likely to be the embalming incision, because it's in the left loin and left hypochondrial yeah, region. Which is, which and it's is very, normal, isn't it? And it's very neat. Yeah. The large wound identified is completely separate from the standard embalming incision, which is also visible on the CT scan. This presents the team with a dramatic development. I suspect the wound is here. Okay. And this uh, extends, if, if a, a, a knife were placed through the abdomen, mm -hmm. it would have gone through this small bowel here, large bowel here, mm -hmm. maybe even into the liver here and the large vessels at the back of the abdomen. Why do we think this is a wound from a stabbing rather than, say, damage from impaling yourself or falling on something, like, you know, that sort of thing? Well, I think, I think, I'll go further than that. I think this is an assassination. I think the sight of the wound tells us and the size of the wound. If we're imagining that I'm attacking you from the front, yeah. and if I'm coming in and I'm trying to stab you here, yeah, be your hands are going to be all over the place, I'm going to be trying stabbing you here, mm -hmm. here and here. And certainly not up and under. Certainly like not that. up and under and there's liable to be cuts on the arms. Yeah. And, uh, yeah. uh, which, which we don't see. Which we so. don't see. Right. We see a large irregular wound in the right hypochondrial region. Our assassin would approach from behind. Right. I step from the rear, hand over the mouth, hand goes up, I twist my body in, knife rams up, then spinning it around and moving it around as much as possible to do the maximum amount of damage before pulling the blade out and making a run for it. The violence of the stab wound would have caused extreme trauma to the liver, leaving the lady in unbearable pain. The reason it will be so nasty with the liver is that it's an incredibly vascular organ. It's right. got so many blood vessels going through it to, to do the job that it does in the body. Now, here's our weapon. Now, you can imagine that if this is penetrating through, the abdominal wall goes up into the liver and lacerates here and he gruddles it around and he does as much damage as he possibly can. And you can see yeah, just how vascular this liver is and all these little bile ducts yeah. here and blood vessels. This would have been pumping out blood, you know, at the rate of knots. Incredibly messy then, I mean, a lot of obvious signs. A lot, a lot of blood and guts. Mm. The guts would have been prolapsing out the wound. There would have been an enormous amount of blood. So we have this, this graphic evidence for this vicious and violent and terminal uh, assault on this 30-year-old woman. How long, you know, how long would it have been before she died? What would have been that sequence, do you think? I, I would think it would just have been a matter of minutes. Mm. Uh, if the, the knife had penetrated even deeper and, and maybe taken out the major vessels, right. the back death would have been, you know, in under a minute. Through her oh, mind must have been oh, passing all of that uh, family and relations and what's happened and why has it happened and f just amazing fear. I would have think it would just be a world of pain. With the shocking revelation that this mummy was violently murdered, the team now need to work out why someone would have wanted to kill the lady. In a search for more clues, Joanne and Jill are trawling through the Egyptian archives at the Literary and Philosophical Society Library in Newcastle. It has an extensive historical collection of books, periodicals and newspaper reports charting the birth of Egyptology as a science in the early 19th century. The society hosted a public exhibition of the mummy when it first arrived in the country almost 200 years ago in 1821. All right. Oh, 
what you got there. Oh, lots of treats for us to look at. Excellent. I've come across this one, which actually look quite interesting. It's the reports, papers and catalogues mm. of the Literary and Philosophical Society from Newcastle upon Tyne. Mm. 1820 to 1821, yeah. so that's coinciding with our date. But if we have a look through, it's quite a strange book in its nature. It's more like a scrapbook, actually. And I think if we just have a sort through. Oh, yeah. It's all... Handwriting. Yeah. Very beautiful handwriting, but then you've got small yeah. articles. Like newspaper clippings. Like newspaper clippings. But the book contains more than just newspaper articles. It's about to reveal a very big clue. Okay. Well, God, that's interesting. A, a specimen, specimen of the cloth and cord taken from the mummy at the Literary and Philosophical Society Newcastle on Tyne. I'll let you do the honours. Oh, 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 oh here we go. Very, very careful. <laughs> what a result. That's incredible. Look at that. They this have kept amazing. it in a book. That's fabulous. That's for fabulous. over 200 years. <laughs> it's still very dusty. It actually. is, yeah. Let's close it up. That is. Oh. I've just breathed in back to our nap time. It's nice. <laughs> <laughs> What a discovery! You don't usually make archaeological discoveries in a library, do you? From the start of the investigation, the team had no access to the mummy or interior of the coffin, so the finding of these linen samples is a huge breakthrough. Tiny fragments of the linen wrappings are cut off to be taken away for chemical analysis in Stephen's lab. The entire embalming process would take around 70 days and was performed by priests and embalmers who had a detailed knowledge of the human anatomy. Some organs would be removed to avoid decay. The body cavity was then packed with linen and spices before the body was finally wrapped in many layers of linen cloth. It's these linen wrappings that Stephen is analysing for their chemical fingerprint. Through GCMS, gas chromatography, mass spectrometry, he will be able to identify the chemical compounds present on the linen sample. The technique works on the principle that every chemical turns to a gas at a specific temperature. By gradually heating the microscopic samples taken from the linen, it should reveal the many hundreds of compounds it contains by examining the point at which they turn to gas. This will provide a chemical fingerprint of each of the components used to embalm the mummy. Well, I've never sampled from a book before, but uh, it's looking quite interesting. And what we actually have is a ruminant fat mixed with castor oil, balsam, trace of coniferous in is that all? Yes, that's all. Is there nothing particularly exotic? No, not really, no. Well, surely you'd expect a, a few more exotic commodities, given the status of this woman. That sounds rather like a collection of somewhat mundane ingredients. There does seem to be a contradiction here between the materials used and the quality of the cartonage we see. So I suppose that the question we should think about is, is why. But you, you see here um, the combustion markers, which we see if something has been very strongly heated. So it perhaps suggests um, that someone was in a rush rather than doing a good job. The GCMS test has not only identified that relatively cheap materials were used in this embalming, but also that the materials used had been severely overheated. This correlates with the results from the three-dimensional print of the mummy's head, displaying large amounts of decomposition, also indicating an incompetent and rushed embalming. This is highly suspicious, as the mummification of members of Egyptian high society was a precise and delicate art.
No, it just doesn't add up. The way she was mummified, the ingredients aren't what one would expect no. in her apparent status. So what's going on? I'm not quite sure. Uh, and possibly suggest something a little sinister. The results of the chemical analysis indicate that the violent stabbing of Bach den Ho was just the first of a series of heinous crimes to be committed against this Egyptian woman. Professor Don Brothwell has been conducting further analysis. He's a leading physical anthropologist who specializes in paleopathology and in analyzing anomalies in the human anatomy. Using the three-dimensional data from the CT scan, he's identified a shocking new development. Well, I've been looking through this area of the head and neck. So if we get these CT scans and move through from the face back into the throat area there, first of all, you can see the tongue in the jaw. And as you move back towards the neck region, nothing then in the throat area. There's no windpipe running there at all. They've slit under the tongue, removed the windpipe and so on, cleaned it up, and then inserted a large wadge of, I would think, linen or something of that sort of thing. I mean, my feeling is that that was a decision which they took for some carefully thought out reason. And it might have, in fact, you know, infringed the usual policies in terms of embalming. So you're saying this was a premeditated Move. A part of their technique. Yeah, which is something I've never seen in any other mummy. Mm -hmm. the, the complete removal of, of this part of the body. Yeah. Well, it it's... wasn't a standard part of the procedure, was it? Well, it is here. Of all the human organs required after death, the throat was one of the most important for ancient Egyptians. According to their belief system, the deceased had to be able to speak his or her own name to the god Osiris, lord of the afterlife, to then be judged upon entry into the eternal paradise for the soul. In the eyes of ancient Egyptians, removal of the throat during mummification would prevent this sacred ritual from taking place. Why take out the throat, the voice box, the, the very organs that are required, we know, to breathe again in the next world, to speak your name in the next world. Yeah. When she's there before the gods, she physically cannot speak her name before yeah. them. She yeah. can't identify herself. The cartonage can't identify her. So yeah. it, it does give me some, some cause for concern, yeah. I think. From the very beginning, this case of the sealed coffin looked almost impossible as the mummy investigation team were denied any kind of access to the body. Against all odds and through a combination of forensic excellence and old-fashioned detective work, they've built an incredible picture of who this woman was and how she died. Based on her overbite, we can say with some confidence that she was likely of high status. Well, from the chemistry, uh, it's certainly possible that some sort of concealment uh, was going on. I'll go further than that. I think this is an assassination. There's the family, there's the scribes, and there's the priesthood. But it could have been any of the three. Without even laying a finger on the body, the mummy investigation team has discovered that this woman was murdered by a savage knife attack to the abdomen. She was robbed of her life, and even worse in Egyptian eyes, robbed of her passage into the next world. This was sabotaged by a hurried embalming, the removal of her throat, and the incorrect inscription of her title on the coffin. She was murdered in real life and in the afterlife. 
it's been very gratifying for me that we've actually been able to make this person live again in a physical sense um, when we've had absolutely no access to the body. I think what was interesting for me was the chemistry, because um, it really pointed to um, a rush job. For several centuries, she's been called backed whore knacked, when actually what she really was called is backed in whore. Mm. Merely saying that is to revive her soul. One thing is clear. Someone with huge power and influence hated her so much. She really did live in this world of pain for the, the awful few seconds before she passed away. They killed her twice.